Yeah, so this, uh, this morning I just, uh, or in preparing for the service, I just felt something of, of really trusting the Lord, of moving deeper into Jesus Christ and into the calling He has for us. And uh, yeah, so the, the title of my sermon this morning is um, Serves Up. <laughs> so Freddie saying about a lot of people at the beach, that's the closest some of us will get for this December holiday, so enjoy it. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, so so before getting to the to the part I really want to get stuck into, we've been really confronted the past few months and weeks, you know, just with people really struggling, uh, people in marriages going through difficult times, and um, People really struggling to find their feet in Jesus, and yeah, I, I think it must be such a, a wake up call for us as the as the body of Christ to to not slumber or sleep, but to to be sensitive where the Lord has placed us and where He wants to use us. Um, yeah, I, I was just reminded of a song by Casting Crowns. It is called "What If I Gave Everything," and they can just throw it up. I just want to highlight some of the words. Um, if you have some time, go and listen to it. And I just want to read the, the blue parts. Um, so all my life, I longed to be a hero. My sword raised high, running to the battle. I was going to take giants down, be a man you would write about. Deep in my chest is the heart of a warrior. And I think that is how, how God creates each, each and every one of us. And... Then he says, why, so why am I still standing here? Why am I still holding back from you? I hear you call me out into deeper waters, but I settle on the shallow end. I'm so afraid of what it might cost to follow you. I'd walk by faith if I could get these feet to move, but I don't want to live that way. Um, I don't want to look back someday on a life that never step, stepped across the line. And then it says, um, you've given me a faith that can move a mountain, just in line with what Freddie said, but I'm still playing in the sand, building little kingdoms that will never stand. I hear you call me out into deeper waters, but I settle on the shallow end. And uh, yeah, this morning, just something of God calling us into deeper waters. Um, you know, Jesus instructed us in, in Matthew 28 to make disciples of the nations. And, uh, and we must realize how big that picture is. Jesus didn't uh, speak out of context when he said it. He meant the nations. And uh, I'm not saying each one of us should now go to Uzbekistan or Somalia and, and become missionaries. But, but we must certainly trust the Lord for more and, and be open to to go where he calls us. I think we've, we've lost, in many cases, just that intentionality to contend for what, what God has promised for us and what he has in store for us. Um, yeah, so I think we must just be at a place where we spend the talents that God gives us. That we do not come to a place one day when we stand before him and, uh, and we've buried it in the ground. Um, yeah, so, so while it's December and, and a lot of us dreams about going to the beach, I think some of us are still going. But, but when, we, when we are at the beach, you know, there's always different levels of beach goers. Um, you get those who stay on the sand, those who are afraid they might rust. Um, so my dad is one of them. He also doesn't take off his shoes when he's on the beach. And... Uh, yeah, then you get those who like to play in the shallow waters, you know, like our kids. So they wait for what is left of, of, of the waves and run away from it. They like the sand between their toes and, and to get their feet wet. Um, then there's some of us who like to play in the break of the waves. And that's always a difficult place because you have the potential to do some body surfing, but there's also the potential of being rolled like a drum. And, uh, and when you get stuck in the break of the waves, you know, that's always a difficult space because you always have this picture of coming out of the waves, you know, get your Baywatch on and, and, uh, 
and you lose it because it's just finding your feet and trying to see where you are and, and get out of the waves. And uh, then you get the people behind the break of the waves, those who can read the swells, get on a bodyboard or a, or a surfboard and just enjoy the energy that the waves create. No effort from their side, just riding the waves that comes in. And, and I think there's a picture of freedom and a picture of, of just um, enjoyment in that, that the Lord wants us to see. Um, they're at the right place at the right time. And uh, yeah, over the, I think over the past few weeks, um, that scripture in Ezekiel 47 came out a bit, which is a strong prophetic scripture for this, for this church. Just that streams of living waters will flow, flow from you. And it's so beautiful. Freddie just prayed about bearing fruit and having leaves that are green. And that's absolutely what we trust the Lord that should come from this church. And uh, I just want to read that scripture for you from Ezekiel 47, from verse 1 to 12. Um, the heading is water flowing from the temple. Um, so now this is Ezekiel writing. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. So Ezekiel describing the layout of the temple and, and how this water is flowing. Then he brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the water was trickling out on the south side. Going on, a east, going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits. Now that's about uh, 500 meters. And then he led me through the water in this river that was ankle deep. Again he measured a thousand and led me through the water and it was knee deep. Again he measured a thousand and led me through the water and it was waist deep. Again he measured a thousand um, and it was a river that I could not pass through for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. As I went back, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on, on one side and on the other. And he said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Araban. Then the, the angel continues describing, uh, or Ezekiel continues describing the trees on the bank and the life that this, this water brings. And... Um, you know, just this beautiful picture of Ezekiel being taken by, by this angelic guide and, um, and he finds himself walking in this water and, and he's growing deeper, step by step, or not step by step, but gradually he's getting into deeper waters. And um, up to the place where, where it's so deep that Ezekiel cannot stand and he's submerged in the water or he can swim in the water. And um, I just want to stand still at this for a bit before yeah not not focusing on the on where the river flows but where Ezekiel finds himself in the water and and when we look at the application of or the applicability of Ezekiel you know God is uh, wanting to restore his people from exile so Ezekiel was actually writing this book in in exile in Babylon and um, and I think it's such a, a shadow and type of what we see today of, of God wanting to give us freedom uh, when we are in exile or in bondage. And, and I really want, do believe that, yeah, that God wants to bring us to that place where we bear fruit and bring God's healing um, when we are totally consumed by the Spirit. But before, before I elaborate a bit on, on going deeper into the water, I, I really just felt to to take a few steps back and stand still on the assurance of salvation. So when we come to salvation, I believe God gives us the ability to swim. So, so I believe when we come to salvation, we step into the water. And, uh, and it doesn't matter how deep the water looks, we decide how deep we go. But if we enter the, the most deepest part, we will not drown. That's the promise God gives us when we come to salvation. 
we can still choose to stay on, you know, in the shallow end and just keep our, our toes wet. But I do believe God, God wants us to, to go deeper. Um, we will never really experience that joy and freedom that we see with those guys behind the break of the waves. And uh, yeah, when, we, when we look at Scripture, you know, Jesus is speaking about salvation as something that happens from the Spirit. It's not something that's man-made. It's not something that we, we can carry um, because it will become a heavy burden. So in John 3, verse 1 to 5, um, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, who is one of the Pharisees. Um, and it goes as follows. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And you know what's, what's so beautiful about this, and, and if you dig a little deeper into the word, yo, Jesus, I think he built the Pharisees and the, and the Sad Sadducees with Scripture, because Jesus is actually referring to a Scripture from Ezekiel 36 here. And I want to read it to you because it's so beautiful. And um, it goes as follows, Ezekiel 36 from verse 25 to 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules. And um, yo, that scripture is so such a beautiful picture of what Jesus come and do to us when we come to salvation. So he comes and he cleanses us. He, he puts a new heart in us and he, his spirit come and, um, you know, just uh, I will give you a new spirit from within. So we must realize that, that we are, when we go through this new birth, there's an entire regeneration, and it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, we are not saved by a church or by doctrine. We are saved from within, from the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and a beautiful scripture that, and it's a long piece of scripture that I would like to read for us. Um, it's just Romans 8 from verse 1 to 17. Um, yeah, I don't want to read too fast through it. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. So God knew that no man will be able to fulfill the law or be the perfect sacrifice. So he sent Jesus who would um, be the righteous requirement uh, for us to stand before God. Um, verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So we see there's a definite separation between flesh and spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead 
dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12. So then, brothers, are we debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh? For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. So that's quite a mouthful, but I want to highlight a few verses from, from that piece of scripture. Um, uh, Michael Eaton puts up a very practical way uh, for us to, to test from the scripture, you know, if we are saved, just to have that assurance. So the first test, is a general test, um, and we can look at verse 5 and verse 7, and we see that the mind of those that is led by the Spirit are set on things of the Spirit, and we see in verse 7 that the carnal mind, or our sinful mind, um, is enmity against God. It cannot be put before God because it's hostile towards God. So, in a general test, I would like to ask you, if you, if you um, doubt, what, what are my interests? What are the things I mind? And where does the Bible come into the scheme of things? So if you add the weight to those questions, you know, how do you prioritize the, the things of God? Do I delight in <coughs> prayer? And, uh, and I think especially, do I have a concern for people that are lost, you know, a lost and dying world? Then the, the second test, which is we can derive from verse 13 to 16. Um, in verse 13, we see that we will put on, put to death the deeds of the flesh. I think this is the important part. Verse 14 says that we will be led by the Holy Spirit. And verse 15 says that we will be made sons through adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And then in verse 16, it says that the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. So, when we say, what is my attitude towards God? Um, do I love Him? Or do I serve Him out of a place of fear? Um, because I think that, that is a definite line that we can draw. Can I truly say to God, Abba, Father, do you see Him as your Father? Can you call Him Papa? And um, then there's also a consciousness of sin. Do I tolerate sin? Do I make light of it because it's not that bad or it only happens once? Or do I really have a disgust for sin? Do I really um, make effort to, to step away from it? Because it doesn't matter what people say. It must matter what God says about, about these things in our life. Um, yeah, the, the world will really tell you it's not that bad. You know, there is worse sin or, um, you know, don't so be, don't be so radical. And uh, they will tell you you've changed or you're weird or you're not the same anymore. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of testimonies about people who, who walk in that. And um, when we listen to the Spirit and, and step away from, from these things, yeah, and we must really ask the Lord in our hearts, you know, if there is that change and if we get that, that thing that it, it, it wants to push us away from sin, we get a really a disgust for sin, you know, God will honor that. And then the third test is how do I live? What is my actions testifying to the world? And, and this is not a case that, that we are justified by, by our actions. Um, but our rebirth or our conversion, you know, there's a, a new life that should be confirmed by change in our old, from our old state of life. And the Holy Spirit gives us this, this new attitude towards conduct, how we conduct our lives. 
and and we're not perfect and we do make mistakes um but you know we can pray to god to help us and to to really give us the the grace to please him and to be good ambassadors and representatives of of the kingdom of god and uh, you know re we really should be at a place where we're willing to sacrifice everything because um, if we stop and think about what Jesus gave, is he gave everything. He held nothing back. And, uh, <laughs> and the world will try and convince you, but to sacrifice everything, how bad is that going to be? And that's the biggest lie. There's so much joy and freedom and fun and vindication and forgiveness when we come to a place where we surrender. You know, it's, it's so frustrating when the world tells us it's all right to be lukewarm. It's a, it's a dangerous place to be. Friends, family, people that, that surround us, that, that tells us, you know, it, it's a Sunday thing. It's not a, it's not a lifestyle. And, um, and that's utter nonsense. We should not be conformed to the standards and the norms of this world. We should set the standard. And, uh, and I also want to make note of a, quite a terrifying scripture. Um, not that we should be scared, but just for us to, to, to have a look at our hearts. In, in Matthew 7, verse 22, Jesus says, People will stand before him and say, Lord, Lord. And he will tell them to go away because he does not know them. And I don't think this is a place where, where people truly came to salvation. It's people who, who walk in a religious mind state. People who who walk legalistic in, in Christianity, um, but not through regenerated life. And, uh, and we must make sure that, that we, we're, not, we're not legalistic or religious because we want to keep people happy or because it's the right thing to do or it's how we grew up. Um, we can serve in church, do all the good things that God as for us to do, and, and at some point you will just fall under the burden. Because if it's not out of a place of love, or self-sacrifice, or salvation, I think it will become a burden. And I can really testify of that. Um, when, I was, when I went to, to university, I, I wasn't in a relationship with Jesus Christ, but I knew what the right thing was. I was in a charismatic church, um, made notes in the sermon and prayed and um, even raised my hands in worship because it's the right thing to do and i remember it was during july or august and the church where i was I had to they had to put up a tent outside because they were restoring the building and we had, and i remember it was quite a cold evening and i i walked out of that service and i thought what am i busy who am i kidding what am i busy doing there's no life in what I'm, what I'm doing here. And, uh, and, and then the opportunity came for God to, to tell me, you know, come back to me, which happened the 6th of September 2006. And, uh, yeah, so just, just knowing that when we walk in salvation, when we walk in true salvation, there will be a freedom and a joy within because it's from the Spirit of God. Okay, so I'm going to uh, switch over to getting ready to swim. Um, you know, when we, when we go to the beach, there's always an excitement and a joy in our hearts, and, and we look forward to, um, to get wet, and there's this sense of adventure, and, and I really believe that's what God wants for us when we come to salvation. Um, Jesus has big plans for us. I already said, you know, in, in Matthew 28, God says he's got big plans to use us. And um, in John 14, uh, verse 12 and 13, I just want to read, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. How exciting is that? Intimidating. But it shouldn't be scary. It must really excite us to, to know that we can walk 
in the, in the footsteps of Jesus, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So for God's glorification, we can ask God things in His name. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So there's, there's this mandate and this promise, you know, from Jesus. And, uh, and it, yeah, it excites, really excites me. And, and when, we, when we look at this picture that we see from Ezekiel, you know, there's, there's a definite step by step going into deeper. The, the angelic guy doesn't take Ezekiel from ankle deep and throws him into the, the depth of the river immediately. And I think it's, it's so in line with how God wants to take us in our, in our Christian walk. Um, and we also see in Scripture, you know, out of different uh, books in the Bible, how God encourages us to, to grow from infancy into mature Christians. Just want to start with 1 Peter 2, verse 2. It says, um, So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave sp pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. And I think it's just in line with, with Romans 8, where we see a lifestyle that changes. And, you know, here where Peter writes this book that says, be done with all these things of the earth, uh, all this sin, deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Then in Hebrews 5 verse 11, the author encourages us to grow. It says, um, about this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have the powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So we, we, must, we must realize we do start ankle deep, but ankle deep is God's minimum. You know, there's so much more for us. Um, and we must make sure that we're looking forward to greater depths. And uh, Charles Spurg Spurgeon, Spurgeon, I'm not sure how you, you know, say his name, he said the following, Some Christians sail their boat in such low spiritual waters that the keel scrapes on the gravel all the way to heaven instead of being carried on a flood tide. Uh, that's just such a, a picture of what God wants, where He wants us to walk. So we do see that, that there are certain levels of spiritual maturity. And, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of people get stuck ankle deep. They think they've arrived when they come to salvation, but that's only the start of our Christian walk. Um, when we grow in God and, and recognize, start to learn to recognize his voice, memorize the word, spend time in prayer, um, get baptized in the Holy Spirit, learn to pray in the Spirit, um, yeah, and trust God for the outpouring of the gifts. You know, all these things are readying us and making us grow and taking us deeper into the, into the break of the waves. And I think um, the break of the waves is always a difficult space. Because um, many times we are caught here and it's a difficult place because we need to decide to go either go deeper or many times people go back to, to the shallow waters. But I really believe this is the place where, where God wants us to push through. And, um, um, you know, God starts giving us more responsibility. He tests our obedience. Um, he, he gives us certain instructions. And, and we, we learn how it feels to get our feet picked up from the ground. We learn, how, you know, just a little that thing of, of floating in the water. And, uh, and I really believe this is the place where, where we start to become a threat to the enemy. And uh, not, not that we're not a threat when we come to salvation, but, you know, now we're starting to walk in, in things that, that really uh, fights the, the kingdom of darkness and, and brings people to Jesus. And um, and the word says that we will be trialed and tested. 
God will see, you know, what our obedience is and, and how we handle certain things. Because if He can entrust us with the little, He can entrust us with bigger things. And, um, you know, we really see a just an encouragement that Jesus gives us in the Word to, um, to put the armor on, to, to fight this fight spiritually. In James 1 verse 2 to 4, it says, Consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials. Be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance, leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. So there's that thing of leading to spiritual maturity. We have to go through the break of the waves to, to go deeper. And let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking in nothing. And, uh, yeah, I think we are, we are stuck in such a place where, um, where endurance lacks. Unfortunately, our society creates this space of consumerism where we want everything now and we, want, we wanted it yesterday. And, and yeah, just to, to build endurance. And when we look at Romans 3, verse Ah, uh, chapter 5, verse 3 to 5, also from the Amplified, um, it's in line with that scripture in James. It says, and not only this, but with joy, let us exult in our suffering and rejoice in our hardships, knowing that hardship produces patient endurance and endurance proven character against spiritual maturity and proven character, hope and confident assurance of eternal salvation. Such hope in God's promises never disappoints us because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And just, uh, just such an encouragement that, uh, you know, and, and when, we, when we build character and when we build um, spiritual maturity, God says no test will be too great for us to endure. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, um, Paul writes, No temptation regardless of its source. So there's no, there's no bracket of temptation that, that's too big, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience, nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance. But God is faithful to His word. He is compassionate and trustworthy. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. But along with the temptation, he has in the past and now and will always provide the way out as well. So that you will be able to endure it without yielding and will overcome temptation with joy. Oh, such an encouragement. And, uh, and the beautiful picture is when we are on the break of the waves, the, the best way to... To get out of those waves eating you is to dive deeper, is to dive under the oncoming waves. And, uh, and, and I think it's just, uh, that, just that push from the Lord to, to, to take us deeper. Um, and the thing is, when we, when we start to swim, we're in another element. You know, new laws um, operate. The weight is taken off our feet. Um, our backs get a rest. Our joints, you know, are on vacation. So, so we really get to a place where the load is taken off, and uh, and that that is just, um, yeah, just a beautiful picture for me of, of where we will be when we trust the Lord to go deeper. So this morning, the encouragement really is to not arrive in heaven one day and discover discover we only walk in five percent of what God had in store for us but to really want, be desperate for, pursue, fight for it, for the 95% of God's calling. Rather, you know, make mistakes and bump your head, but, but try and push in and, uh, and trust the Lord to walk in, in the calling he has for you. I'm going to pray for us and yeah, we can end off. Yeah, Lord, this, this morning we just want to uh, come before you and we want to honor you for your goodness, Lord. 
And Lord, I just want to say thank you that, Lord, you have created a life in salvation, Lord, in your righteousness, that's full of joy, Lord, that is exciting, that will challenge us, that will, yeah, Lord, build character and, yeah, Lord, really take us to, to new heights, Lord. And, and thank you, Lord, that when we realize we are not subject to the opinion of man or of this world or the standards of this world, Lord, that we can really start picking up speed and, and run in what you have for us. So, Father, this morning I want to pray that, yeah, Lord, as we, as we go into this, you know, just this holiday season, Lord, that we will really make the time to stop and, and just evaluate where we find ourselves, Lord, that we will put aside some time, Lord, and, and get quiet and, yeah, Lord, just trust your Holy Spirit to, to speak to us, Lord, and, and reveal things to us. To get us excited, Lord, and, and yeah, Lord, to bring joy, Lord, to our current situations. Father, I want to pray for yeah, just the people that that you've placed in our immediate um, sphere of influence, Lord, people around us that are in desperate need of Jesus, Lord. Open our eyes to them and uh, yeah, just show them to us, Lord, and, and give us your heart for the people around us. Thank you for your love and thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen.